Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Healthy Indoors Live Show. I'm your host, Bob Krell. I'm the founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine, and I'm happy you're able to join us today. Um, we have a good group of people in our virtual studio audience, and of course, many of you are watching us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, the, you know, the like. Uh, so welcome to everybody. We're happy to see you. Um, today's topic, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about some effective solutions uh, for indoor air quality issues in buildings, uh, which is kind of a continuation of topics we've been doing uh, for the past several weeks. So we're real excited uh, to continue that conversation. With us today is Jesse Coiro. He's the Director of Growth and Strategic Initiatives at Erlab. Jesse has over 20 years of experience providing solutions to the biopharma, pharmaceutical, medical device, and educational markets, with his specially being focused on filtered solutions for the protect, protection of personnel, facilities, and the environment. Jesse has also experienced working with hospitals, helping develop plans to adhere to the USP 797 standards, while also providing solution, solutions such as environmental monitoring, sterile processing, and proficiency testing. Um, so a lot of stuff there. So we're really, uh, we're, we're pleased to have Jesse. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bob, for having me. I appreciate How are it. You? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, so you're coming to us from somewhere in Massachusetts. I forget the city. Raleigh, near Newburyport. North Shore. Okay, great. So, um, so, you know, one of the things, you know, many people in the audience may not be familiar with, you know, some of the things that you've been involved with, uh, with ER Lab, and I know we've had some discussions over the past few weeks leading up to the show, um, but your company is uh, predominantly been focused on dealing with uh, the laboratory environments, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. Our lab, we, we started the company in 1970 as a, as a uh, provider for filtered solutions uh, for portable laboratories, really trying to integrate solutions where we can we can have flexibility and portability in the laboratory with ductless fume hoods. Uh, many people in the lab industry understand ducted fume hoods. It's really where you extract chemicals and you throw them out into atmosphere. And we invented the first ever ductless fume hood so we could capture and contain uh, within the fume hood and not throw out pollutants out into the atmosphere atmosphere. Fast forward 50 years later, here we are today, and we're, we have uh, big initiatives moving forward with helping buildings implement and achieve LEED certification in zero net energy. Um, and filtration is the heart of what we do. It's part of our DNA at the molecular level and at the particulate level. Today, a year after the pandemic, you know, we, we knew we had technologies available that could help develop and implement as mitigation strategies in buildings without the costly upgrades to HVAC. And that would be the HABEL system of above me. And that's just a, it's a HEPA filtered H14 system that really truly provides mitigation solutions for particles, viruses, viable uh, particles. So, you know, that, that's what we're focused on today in the health and healthcare division, but we still very much focused in the laboratory world. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh... 2020. Well, first off, you know, you're, you're in a really robust lab and at some point we'll have you pull back and show us the whole place uh, because it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, facility that you have there. It's a training facility and a, a, basically a demonstration facility, uh, which is working nice for the show today, by the way. Uh, but, you, you know, so, you, you know, you had plans and, you know, again, in your target market and suddenly we, we have a pandemic last year and that, that did cause a, a bit of a, a bit of a shift for you guys, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, I was, first of all, everybody was concerned about their business, what's going to happen with all the shutdowns, if people aren't using laboratories, they're not using fume hoods um, or storage solutions. And so, you know, we had a, we had to kind of reinvent ourselves in, in a manner of how can we uh, introduce the technology as an indoor air quality solution. And that, that was really where the halo came to play, which has been part of our portfolio since 2014 to capture and any type of emissions in the laboratory on the VOC side, acid side and formaldehyde side, as well as on the particulate side. And we knew for sure, just CFD and all of our test results that this product was absolutely going to reduce and provide dilution equivalencies um, within the facility, drastically reducing mitigation, uh, the transmission risks of, of any virus, including SARS-CoV-2, but also influenza and, and other airborne viruses in addition to improving overall indoor air quality. So yeah, it's been, it's been a 
change for us, for sure. I mean, ch challenging, I mean, from where you're coming from with the laboratory environment, um, I'm kind of in awe of the fact that you actually have technology that can, you know, can let people work in laboratory hoods and exhaust that processed air back into the space. Um, yeah. I, I wasn't really aware that even existed, to be honest, pr prior to uh, us meeting uh, that type yeah. of technology. You know, sure. I always thought everything was shot outdoors. <laughs> Unfortunately, the majority of it is no. And, and, you know, when people see us at a trade show or an event or in a live show like we're doing today, they think of us as a new company. But no, 53 years later, this is all we've been doing. We don't we don't duct anything or throw anything out into the environment. It's a complex technology. Um, it's it's based on molecular filtration and we have to understand what our limitations are um, first and foremost so that we can ensure and guarantee safety within the labs that we install the product. Um, it's very complex. We have to test and validate all of our products according to most stringent lab laboratory standards. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. On the particulate side, to be honest with you, it's easy in comparison to the molecular side. <laughs> You know? yeah, well, yeah, I, 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 and I assume it would be right. Particulate. Yeah. I mean, we we have you know HEPA filtration technology. You know the uh, the impingement type filters. I mean, they're effective at grabbing particles. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. You have to understand the way HEPA filtration works. It's it's a it's fairly simple technology. Um, there are many different rated HEPA filters. Um, there's H14, H15, then you get into ULPA filtration. And of course, as we all know, you have MERV filters too. It's about the overall efficiency and the effectiveness of capturing particles down to a certain micron size, as we know. Um, again, fairly simple in comparison to understanding uh, thousands and thousands of molecules, how they react to one another once you're doing reactions inside of a fumoid, how they react within the carbon bed. So it's a um, it's interesting on all fronts, to be honest with you, because we you learn a lot as well in these different markets. We're 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 providing solutions to industries we never thought we would be involved with, um, like long term care facilities, retail space, mm -hmm. um, schools outside of the lab, K through twelve, Head Start programs, Title One schools. Um, it's really opened up our eyes a lot to some of the a lot of the challenges they're facing. Um, how they're trying to comply with ASHRAE and CDC guidelines to the increase of air change rates, upgrade to MERV 13 filters, the impact it has on their bottom line, um, and the impact it will have on the overall operation operational expense. Uh, not many people recognize that because there are there are guidelines in place to to help with mitigation, but mm. for school settings and even nursing homes, it's almost impossible for them to achieve those type of recommendations simply because their HVAC is not equipped to do so. Right. I mean, because it's a major, you know, it's all well and good to say, hey, bring out, you know, bring more uh, fresh air ventilation and, you know, put higher efficiency filters in. But if your equipment doesn't have the capacity to do that, it, yeah, you that's can't not do an it. option. It's, it's really not, not. It's not an option. And that's really what this product does. It's, it's, it's a supplemental solution to your current HVAC. And it's, it's a permanent infrastructure solution. As you see, ceiling mounted. It's tied to the electrical. It can't be shut, on, shut off accidentally. It provides very predictable airflow patterns, which is critical to reducing load concentrations. You know, and we've done a number of different studies, studies both in controlled atmospheres and then in real world settings, which is really paired review data, which we, we want to look at to understand the true efficacy of this product at, re at reducing concentrations, because that's ultimately what we need to do. We want to provide dilution equivalencies to traditional air change rates that an HVA system will be able to provide you with. I mean, so there's, there's another factor um, that I, I, you know, just seems to, seems to come to mind. If if you're be able to you're able to create those uh, dilution equivalencies, right? The uh, ventilation equivalencies yeah. with that, th there's got to be some net energy savings, right? To an operation on a building as well, opposed sure. to throwing the air outdoors, right? Absolutely. You know, these run on 50 watts of energy. When we talk about the increase in air change, you know, you want to try to open up your dampers to 50 to 100% if possible to let as much outside air in as, as you can. You have to look at the cost implications involved in that. You know, I'm working on a, with the school district specifically here in Massachusetts that did all the right things and they upgraded their HVAC system and they opened up their dampers to 37%. That's all they could do. And they saw an increase of their energy expenditure month over month to about 54% increase. So I, I, it's That's huge, huge and it's not sustainable. And my fear is that a lot of these school districts, if they can and their budget allows, they'll upgrade their HVC system, which is fine. Great. You should upgrade it anyway. Mm -hmm. sure. But in order to maintain the right air change rates, the proper outdoor air, as you know, ASHRAE and CDC recommends, 
it's just not sustainable for these schools and their budgets. So they're going to pull back. They'll do it at first. And then, you know, everybody's going to be complacent. And we'll right. pull that back a little bit. We'll now shut our dampers a little bit more. Oh, a little bit more. And we're going to save more. And ultimately, all the cost upgrades that they've done to their, their system is going to be for nothing. Um, and we don't want that to happen. With this system, again, 50 watts of energy, you're looking at about a dollar per day running 24-7. Uh, very sustainable. Well, you know, there's another factor too. Like, even if you you, you have the ability to open up dampers and you know, bring a lot more air in the in the uh, existing mechanical equipment, and you know, yes, there's there's obviously a, a substantial energy penalty. But the other factor is is most of these systems are not really designed to handle that additional latent load that you create. Right. By, you know, you're able to heat and cool. You know, the equipment can, you know, can be pushed a little bit beyond with the heating degree days and all that, but, right. but you don't have that latent, uh, latent moisture removal capacity. So the other problem is if you start to open you up your be- outside air dampers, you're going to make your building swamps. You absolutely, absolutely. There's a lot of implications in doing that. So, you know, it, we feel again, a lot of engineering control systems can work together to, to develop the best mitigation plan. Nothing is a silver bullet, right? And we have to understand that. Mm-hmm but it's how they work together. And so we should, if we can, increase our air changes with our HVAC system, but you must have proper filtration. You must have predictable airflow patterns in order for it to truly work. If you're just increasing airflow to increase airflow and you don't have the right airflow patterns, you create a turbulent environment, you don't have the right filtration, you can re-entrain all the potential contaminants back into the atmosphere, into the ambient room. If you're letting more outside air in, you have to understand what the implications may be from the polluted outside air coming indoors. So there's a lot of implications that need to be looked at when you're trying to truly develop these strategies. Well, I mean, we, we certainly, I, I think many of us, you know, many people out there labor under the pretense that outdoor air is necessarily fresh air. And that, you know, certainly <laughs> that's not the case. I mean, no. in urban environments, um, many many agricultural environments, you know, that, that's right. not the case either. And, you know, certainly outside of, you know, North America, outside of the U.S., I mean, th- it's not even a, f- a feasible option. You know, places like India and, you know, yeah. your, your downtown Beijing, you know, bringing in more outside air, that's not an option. That's no. not better air. That's worse air. That's but, you know, worse air. Even on the West Coast, you look at the wildfires. Sure. It's not an option. And we, we've worked with many accounts that they've had to literally evacuate their buildings because of the wildfires, because they're trying to let as much fresh air into the building. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's detrimental to what they're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's, a, there's an impact with everything you do. And you have to understand what all these different changes can do to your building from humidity to temperature control to what type of pollution you're letting in your air. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot there. So we just, we want to be a resource to, to companies to truly educate them on what products really do, the true efficacy behind the products um, and how, again, they can work together and what the potential impact would be if they were to upgrade their system. And just, you know, just educate. That's the best we can do. And, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot going on in this industry today uh, that we're not happy about. There's a lot of falsified information, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's what can we do and, and be a resource? And that's what we have to focus on. Well, I guess we had on a few weeks back, Vinny Lobdell, you know, made a comment that I, I think is very true. He said there's there's a lot of technology and no technology is bad. It's just that it, it's a lot of times things are misapplied and, right. and you know, and there's no so like you, you you said earlier there's no silver bullet really there there no. is not one solution right and Vinny Vinny stressed that a few weeks back too uh, you know and, right. is that there isn't a, sing, a single solution you really have to evaluate the environment you're trying to address what you're try, right what are the constituents you're dealing with there and uh, yeah. that goes back to being an IAQ consultant it's the same mindset you come in you, one size doesn't fit all there's not a single <laughs> solution out there absolutely and it's funny because we you know we get requests and can you just provide me a quote so, yes but. No, we have to truly understand there's a lot of different dynamics we have to be aware of, right? What's the size of space, the cubic volume of air we want, we're looking to process? What do you have as far as air change rates? What's the CFM coming out of your, your supplies? And what's being sucked up in the returns? And there's a lot of implications involved there. Where are they located? And then we can provide the proper positioning. It's not just stick a product in the corner of a floor and you're good to go. It's much more than that. And you, when you're dealing with a true professional, you understand that, it, yeah, it's much more than just sticking a a filtered solution somewhere in the room and calling it a day. Well, I mean, that's the same issue for consultants too. People in the, you know, in the indoor environmental space, you get a potential client calls up and goes, can you come out and test our air? 
<laughs> and tell us if it's good. It's like, yeah. come on now. <laughs> you know, right. we kind of do need to zero in on, you know, what's going on? What, you know, yeah. why are you asking for this? You know, what are the underlying situation, you know, or you know, circumstances? And uh, what are you trying to achieve? <laughs> Biggest question I ask, what are you trying to achieve? Are you looking exactly. to increase to eight air change rates per hour? Or are you good at the three to four? What are you looking to achieve? And we can, again, we can develop a plan that's going to work for you, but we don't know what you're looking to achieve. So just to throw a quote out there, it's, eh, it's really not how we want, we want to do business. Yeah. And, and that's, you really can. And I think that's a, that's a global answer for indoor environmental issues. You know, there is just, yeah. you know, what, what is good is so subjective anyway, but one thing you did mention, and I, I you touched on, and I, I really want to elaborate uh, and have you elaborate on it a little bit um, is the fact, you know, it's not just a matter of even creating those air changes, right? It has to do with also airflow patterns and distribution, because yeah. obviously, you know, if you're doing air changes, you know, all this great air change capability in a building, but it's all happening up at the ceiling, not in the occupant's breathing zone. You know, that, that's all well and good on paper and mathematically it looks fantastic. Yeah. But in reality, are you, you know, that it's much more complex, right? It's much more complex. And you have to understand, uh, we, we'll talk about SARS-CoV-2 because that's the biggest topic of discussion today. But, you know, you look at how these viruses remain suspended in the air. They, they stay, you know, once these droplets are released, they then desiccate, they become droplet nuclei, and they, they stay suspended in the air at about five to six feet in space, right at the breathing zone of the occupant. And we don't want to take those pollutions and, and, and subject somebody else to those concentrations with a filtered solution that's behind them, you know, in the corner of a room somewhere. We want to take those up vertically away from the breathing zone as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. But then when we dis disperse air, we also don't want to create a turbulent zone. So we want to create a Coyonda effective airflow, which I'm sure you understand what that is. It's a very predictable airflow pattern. So we take the dirty air up, we disperse the clean air out horizontally, and then we just create a clean curtain continuously. So it's very critical of how these airflow patterns um, are, are achieved and in, in the importance of how that's going to really determine the true efficacy and effectiveness. It's about reducing again reducing that load concentration so i mean Everywhere. not just yeah i mean and that's i think what you're what you're hitting on here is really important is that it's is what's the net effect right i mean right. You, again you, and this is true for any technology and any device like the device oh. can do the, you know xyz that's all well and good but what does it do in that space now that you're actually implementing that as a solution and, and what's happening what's the net effect in the space uh, that's that's yeah. critical, right that's the it's difference critical. between being overly successful or just being marginally successful or providing a false sense of security to some you know yes we provide h14 hepa filters it's it's you know a very robust hepa filter we can also in integrate ulpa filters in the system it's only part of the story the hepa filter it's been tested as en 1822 standards i mean it meets all criteria but it's how effective is the unit at ensuring that that filter is going to capture and contain the viruses or the pollutants present in the facility. Um, you know, it's, it's, we have, like you said, we have to understand what it does in the space, not just what the product can do in a very controlled chamber, right? And we have testing studies done. Yes, we had a testing controlled atmospheres for MS2 bacteriophage testing to understand what the load reductions were, but we also wanted to test them in real world settings and challenge the system. Um, so much so we actually installed eight units at a very large shoe wear, uh, warehouse on the West Coast called WSS um, at 186,000 cubic foot facility, only eight units. Now every unit's rated to provide about three and a half air change rates based on 3,500 cubic feet of space. So we're looking at that and we'll say, okay, how we worked with a, a IAQ specialist on the West Coast. How can we work with their current engineering control systems currently that they have in place, integrate the halo in parallel to their returns and get this to really achieve the results we're looking for. And what we thought we were going to see was about a, a baseline reduction of about 20 to 30% of particles, you know, between 0.3 micron and, and five micron in size. And ultimately we found, we saw a reduction of greater than 80% across the board, you know, and this is a store in Los Angeles. So the air in general that's being entered into the facility alone is not the cleanest. Um, and it just, it just shows the efficacy. And, we, you don't really know what it does until you challenge it in settings like that. But, that, but that's true with any technology, right? I mean, absolutely. It, it's, you know, laboratory, you know, laboratory results 
you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're a control. benchmark, they're a bench, they're, they're a controlled benchmark. benchmark. Right. I mean, you know, years ago I was involved with uh, research on uh, air duct cleaning with, with the EPA. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we did a, we did a first, a controlled uh, lab study at RTI down in North Carolina and everything, you know, the results were like these always remarkable results. And it's like, yeah, except this isn't what it's like when you're crawling into a crawl space and you're, you know, and you've got configurations that aren't built to code and things aren't right yeah. you know, the real world. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, are, are, are you getting that same result? And, you know, truly, right. you know, in that pilot study, it showed the difference between the lab and the field were like night and day. What <laughs> happened? You know, it's just totally yes. different results. Of course. But, it's pre unpredictable, right? When you put it in an unpredictable setting, we've well, got more variables. Set. When you're it when you're looking at, with anything, again, I'm not you know I'm not citing anything singularly here, but I mean, you look at anything, anything in a laboratory setting in a controlled setting. You, yeah. Part of that process, right, is to have controlled parameters. <laughs> you don't have a lot of variables. You you want limited variables so you can study. But yeah. when you get out in the in the real world, you know the parameters, uh, you know, kind of they dictate themselves. <laughs> You don't really get to choose your your real world parameters. They're you there. You don't. You don't. And that's that's the best data you can have, as far as I'm concerned. You have to do the lab test. You have to do those studies for sure. But the best data you can obtain is is that in, in a real world setting and, and have real paired review data, so to speak. Yeah, uh, I would think. Yeah, I think the lab results are in most cases are best case scenario. It's, yes. It's what you know capabilities of what what this whatever this is can do. You know, in a lab. Okay, great. That's what it. That's what it's right. capable of doing if thing everything goes right. Everything's perfect. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. You know, we we've actually tested the the system in a, in a positive COVID nineteen patient's room at a long term at Avamir Healthcare Associates. We have a case story on our website, um, and we had a room that was was right next to that room that had another positive COVID nineteen patient in it on the same centralized system. So they were f they fed the same supply air. And we really wanted to understand what the reduction was in the airstream and at the return vents. So there was PCR tests performed. We ran swab samples around the bed of both patients, swab samples on the window shelf, and swab samples at the return. Um, the patient in the room with the halo was just at the start of their quarantine or their isolation. And the patient in the room without the halo was towards the end of it. And we knew that because of the viral shedding, right? Everybody's going to shed viruses differently depending on the level of infection. So the patient in the room with the halo was shedding a tremendous amount of virus. And we know that because when we ran the swab samples for the droplets that are going to fall, there was 23,000 copies of RNA at the foot of, around the bed and 812 on the window shelf. With the room in, uh, without the halo, there was non-detectable. However, in the return, in the Airstream, we found 3,500 copies in the room without the halo and zero non-detectable in the room with the halo, which proves, again, the efficacy of what it's doing. It's, it's happening in the air, yeah. yeah. It's cleaning the air and those, those, you know, those droplets that are remaining suspended, which is, you know, the greatest risk of transmission. You know, we, we could talk about that as well. You know, we're, we're, we're very focused on transmission, you know, formite transmission and contact transmission in close proximity to one another. But the biggest problem is the air. We, it has to be addressed. And it's frustrating today because, you know, we're, we're now talking with many different companies. People are becoming complacent because of, well, it's a 14 months. And, and I think that's just natural, you sure. know, way human, yeah. humans react. But also we all are. We all are. A but there's bit. also vaccine complacency. Um, and that scares me because we have, you know, we have the P1 variant, the C37 variant. And those are just two variants that are now seen in South America that we don't know how we're going to react to that when we're vaccinated and it scares me i don't want to become complacent and nor should we jesse i'm telling you i just right before the show i had a conversation with uh someone who had been a guest on our show last year Barun agarwal uh in new delhi in india yeah. i just just was actually yeah. on whatsapp with him and um it's horrible there this it's is like you know for don't think brutal. for one minute that this whole pandemic globally is over the india is now facing a crisis an untold crisis okay the, it it looks like ground zero in new york city back it's, last april there oh it's so scary and, and, and maybe even worse because they were they have many more people to deal with and they don't have the resources they don't have no. enough oxygen they don't i mean no. it's just there it, it's it's a real dire situation and this you're right i i think we in in the united states are getting a, a lot more complacent 
Um, Unfortunately, I, you I know, I mean, it. it's, it's, you know, you're tired, you're tired of it. And, Human you know, nature. most of us have weathered it. Okay. Which unfortunately there's nearly 600,000 people that didn't weather it. Okay. They perished yep. and probably millions more who have long-term effects, you know, so it's, it, this is, yeah, can't be complacent at all. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that that's happening though, because I'm, I'm seeing it. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, I am too every single day. And it is, it is for somebody who's trying to, you know, help provide a part of the solution. It's very frustrating because you get the, well, I don't know, what are our competitors doing? It's like, well, wait, we're looking at this completely wrong. It's not about what our competitors doing. It's about what right. can we do better? We need to learn from our mistakes. You know, we, we, as a country, as a society, we have not addressed air quality appropriately. You know, there are well, ever. Not- <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever, was, our schools, was, you know, the problem in the schools now that, you know, everybody's worried about COVID and the pandemic, schools yeah. have never had good air quality. Oh, I mean, probably the worst, and that, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's, yeah, it is, there's no regulation on the market and you, you just want to see something be done. We want, I want to be able to say, look back and say, okay, we learned from our past mistakes. We're doing it a bit different now. So that when, and I hate saying this, but the, it is the truth. When the next pandemic comes, and it's going to happen, we are better prepared than we were before. And we don't go on this massive lockdown. And maybe we can now, okay, we will have to lock down a little bit, but maybe buildings can stay at 25% capacity because they've addressed the air issue. Mm -hmm. But you also look at, it's not just the virus, it's just indoor air quality. And you look at that alone is a pandemic. 300 or 400,000 people die a year just here in the U.S. because of air quality issues. And contributing to asthma, cardiovascular, yeah, ultra, ultra fine particles that are oh that are gosh. rampant. Yeah, it's, it's just learn. Let's let's just learn from our mistakes and let's. Uh, but it's it's not. But do you happening. think we will? You know, I, I I hate to pose that question to you, but I mean, it's like because oh. I I have I have serious you know, uh, doubt that, that, that we are going to learn from this, you know, it's like, and, and it seems like we're, all, we're almost in some ways doomed to be Groundhog Day, you know, like the movie and just keep repeating it. And, Look, and that would be I, sad. That would be really sad. I, I have a lot of concerns as well. And I kind of can, I mean, we see it in the lab world, uh, you know, with filtered solutions, people, be, they're just so, we're so tied into tradition. How have we done things traditionally? Mm-hmm. that that's the acceptance. That's what we accept. We don't accept newer technology because we fear it. We should fear the traditional technology because it's not doing what it needs to do for today's world. Well, we fear and change in general. Fear change. Humans fear change. You know, you like, humans, humans don't like change and they, and they like to the, follow. They like to be in a group. They like a group of people that agree with them. Right. So we, we, yeah. we need somebody to take the bull by the horns and be the leader, you know, show it, show how it's done. And, you know, uh, but like you, I'm, I'm hesitant in, um, to say, yes, we're going to learn from the mistakes. I, I don't know. I don't know. I hope I've just so. seen, yeah, I've just seen so many examples in my career in the indoor environmental field as a consultant going out and, you know, working toward a solution, you know, like at schools or different places for a s- specific, let's say a mold problem. And, you know, and it was a structural yeah. problem. And then they go and they re-engineer and spend millions of dollars and they screw it up again. You know, yeah. and two years later, you know, we're getting called again to go back into the same facility that's having, you know, a so- different problem, but still related to the fact that they didn't learn a damn thing the first time around. You know, we're back here again. It's like, really? Yeah, we've done, we've seen it. We've worked with school districts that just upgraded their whole science wing. They increased their ventilation rates, improved their HVAC system, came back in for their next semester, ran their experiments, and they had to evacuate because their the VOC emissions were too high. And so therefore they, you know, spent half a million dollars on supplemental solutions like the halo for, you know, t- that they, they shouldn't have had to. They shouldn't have had to. That they <laughs> right, just spent yeah. three million dollars to upgrade the HVAC system on. So, yeah, I mean, well, I love a building that you know was basically torn apart because there was a mold problem and a moisture and moisture intrusion <laughs> yeah. problem, and they rebuild it and they redesign it with a new architectural team because you know the, the original design was terrible. And they come back in, and two years later, we're coming back in and they're doing mold remediation again because the new design failed. It's like, come <laughs> on, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And and there's not yeah. like if that was an isolated case, I would be like, oh well, you know, that was just no. dumb people. But no, this this unfortunately, my 35 years, I've seen it too many times. So sure. uh, so we're we're almost at the halfway point. So those of you in the virtual studio audience we're going to be asking you to turn your cameras on in a minute or so um and uh then we can we'll start taking some uh, questions from from the audience and deal with that but one question i wanted to pose to jesse prior to that um so you know 
how if, if you're out there in the capacity of a facility manager, you know, like, again, we're talking on the commercial side now, not not really single homeowner residence type situation. But, you know, right. on the commercial side, you're a school facility, your healthcare facility, office environment. And again, not talking commercial laboratory environment because that is a specialized right. area. So sure. just general office space or, you know, general populations. Um, how how. How should they be looking at, first of all, what we're, this is a big question, by the way, uh, uh, how should they be looking at the current needs, you know, to address this pandemic and the COVID-19 exposure, or excuse me, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 exposures? I, I hate when people conflate that, you know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, you know, so I can't do it on my own show. Uh, that, and then, but then moreover, how does that equate to moving forward, making decisions that are not just a knee-jerk reaction for now that they're going to pull back on, right? And have it be something that's, you know, like meaningful in the future that improves the environment. And that's so, a long question. You know, and basically trying to develop a permanent solution, right? Exactly. I, I, I and, and more than just a COVID, you know, like taking, taking COVID. this COVID emergency and turning it into something where it's a positive, actionable change going forward. Yeah. I, I mean, you have to look at what I, you start with, what they currently have in place. What do we need to achieve in order to provide mitigation strategies for not just SARS-CoV-2, but for other viruses and indoor air quality. And also understand, importantly, understand the, the, the low density factor in these facilities, you know, because again, it's not, not just one size fits all approach. So it's really, let's take a look at your reflective ceiling plans. Let's understand how this building is going to operate in the new normal. You know, where are people going to be positioned, where your airflow patterns are, and then let's work with you to develop a plan and a strategy that's going to be for the long term. You know, we have a, a great article on a website called the long term playbook to healthy indoor air. It's just that what is the long term playbook? You know, and, and, and how are you going to Im implement that? And that's really, really what we wanted what we're doing with facilities directors and managers that are very much involved with all of these decisions because they're tasked with hey, find a solution. So it's really, let's understand everything from, you know, entry to the building to exit, you know, where we exit the building, where people sit, where they're located, your air change rates, and let's develop a true strategy for the long term. It's a challenge though, right? Because we're going to redeploy uh, people, you know, as far as positions within buildings and some some facilities, you know, some things will change. Yeah. Some, th some things will go back to the way they were, but I think we need that flexibility, right? Going forward, because as you mentioned, and I totally concur, this is not the last global pandemic by far. Unfortunately, you know, I, I know it's, no. it, I mean, they used to be once in a hundred years and this is our hundred year one, but I think they're not going to be once in a hundred years anymore. I think oh. we're going to be looking at more like every decade, some, some catastrophic. Well, event. we've already been there, right? We, we, yeah. we were Ebola. H1, Ebola, H1N1. I mean, these, these yeah. were, these were ep epidemics, pandemics. I, I mean, call it what you want. I knew more people that had H1N1 than I did SARS-CoV-2, thankfully. But it that was also an epidemic. It wasn't treated the way this this is being treated. Obviously, it's it's much bigger. And I we got yeah, we dodged well, some bullets on those. We dodged though. a lot of bullets. You know, I mean, and, and I think we got complacent because yeah, we got through we them close. relatively unscathed. A few thousand deaths, right. and which is not to say that's minor. Because if you're one of the it's, family, you know, if it's one of your family members or your loved right. ones that was one of those few thousand people. It's not that insignificant. But no. But again, I think you know, as a as a uh, national community in the United States and, and probably in a lot of other places, you look at it like, eh, you know, oh, that could have been bad, but it wasn't. We're good. <laughs> we, were, we were literally, we were that close from it exploding and that, you know, again, we didn't learn our lesson there. Part of it is, Bob, is lack of guidance, lack of guidance from, you know, boards and committees and governments that tell you, and authorities. <laughs> yeah, what needs to be done. And that's it. That we saw it at the start of this pandemic. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. It's not airborne. It is airborne. Oh, we're going to retract that statement. Oh, it is airborne again. It's just lack of guidance. And we just need somebody to, you know, take the take hold, take initiative and truly, uh, I don't know, deliver us the truth. Yeah, the the agencies. I mean, you know, we, yeah. we in this country, and again, we're talking United States now, yeah, uh, sure. you know, we, we rely on, you know, I mean, we, we want to be able to rely on our federal authorities and our state authorities to, to give us the right information. I mean, a lot of stuff got politicized, which is like insane. I, I, I for the life of me, I'll never understand politicizing science, but that's another story. Know, well. To me, science is like Neil deGrasse Tyson says it right. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. Science is a fact. 
That, you know? That's right. That's and right. it evolves. That's the other thing. The it fact, absolutely you know, evolves. Because it does evolve over time because it's, it's fact as we know it today based on our current knowledge. And you have to also, you know, science does recognize that there's, you know, the hypotheses are always changing, right? Because the more the more data you get, you go back and reevaluate and, oh, maybe this wasn't, this was the best right. we knew at the time, but it's better now, you know? Right. Absolutely. Anyway, so we've got some questions in queue. So we'll, we'll ask that our, our uh, online studio audience turn your cams on. Um, keep your mics off though, until you're on, uh, actually speaking to us. Um, so we, so we'll start to see some faces popping in and our first question is coming from uh, a gentleman who popped his camera on, uh, a regular Terry Sofer. Hi, Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi. First off, I want to commend, uh, you and Bob for your, uh, focus and your comments on the challenges of, uh, contaminants in outdoor, outdoor air and how ventilation um, can create indoor air problems, not just uh, dilute them. Um, Thank you. I would like to uh, first ask, uh, ask you to clarify your filtration uh, technology. Is it, is it uh, purely adsorption media um, or is it combined with other technology? Good question. So we have we have adsorption media on, on the chemical fume hoods. We also have adsorption media in in the halo above. Um, we don't combine the adsorption and the absorption with the halo yet, um, and it's because you know a lot of a lot of air purifiers will say we have carbon filtration. Eh, eh, that's stretching it. You have to understand carbon filtration. You have to understand. You know, you have to have proper airflow. You have to allow for proper residency time for this to even be truly effective. So for right now, we have two separate halos, one with a HEPA filter and one with a carbon filter. Um, we are in development stages of one that can integrate both with the right airflow, providing the right residency time. We don't have too much static pressure issues um, with the combination of both filtration. So Terry, to answer your question, it's a combination of both. On the fume hoods behind me that you see, we can integrate both absorption and adsorption media into the fume hood. So if somebody's doing exothermic reactions, working with powders, they can do that and also work on their chemical uh, analytics, uh, whatever they're doing. So it's a combination to answer your question. If I could uh, just elaborate on that, um, does the adsorption media uh, include any ability to actually, um, um, what term, uh, to, to destroy um, biotoxic molecules and uh, or Good question. Uh, Nothing's destroyed. Everything's captured and retained. Okay. Well, what we do with some of our technology is we have, we have filtration, pre-filtration before a molecule gets to the actual carbon media, which is coconut shell. Um, and that allows us to slow down the molecule. It allows us to neutralize it if it's an acid. We also have special solutions for ammonia and formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is extremely challenging to capture based on ACGIH standards at 0.75. We have to uh, guarantee that we have released no greater than 1% of the threshold limit value with any of our adsorption media. So understand we have to be at 1% of the ACGIH of any chemical formaldehyde. It's ex extremely challenging. So we have to figure out a way to treat the molecule before it gets to the carbon. For ammonias, it's really about neutralizing the smell, the odor, because you're going you're gonna to smell ammonia much sooner than you are, even, be, even at 1% of the threshold limit value. Um, so it does not destruct anything. I mean, one of the things I, I would say would probably be very challenging, right, Jesse, is that um, – with like technology, like retrofit technology, like a halo units, it's a relatively small footprint. It's a small device. Whereas your, your standalone uh, lab capture equipment, they're they're pretty robust. That's even though it's it's compact, it's still yeah. you have a space to put a lot of uh, adsorbent uh, material there. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you we know, have, where, where you don't really have that in a small ceiling tile grid. Yeah, the the the, the halo is actually not. It's it's a two by four grid. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's about with the HEPA filter. It's about eight inches. The HEPA filter itself is about eight inches thick. So it's a pretty robust HEPA filter. Um, but yeah, on the filter we have you know we can layer up to three levels of filtration on each fan module. If you see the unit behind me, you can kind of see sections broken up above. 
So there's actually four separate fan modules on that system. Each fan module houses up to three filters, a combination of HEPA and carbon filtration. So yeah, it's robust media for sure. You know, you, you look, this is that point of use capture. So we're capturing at concentration loads. Typically on average, our filters last anywhere between 24 and 48 months on, on the adsorption media. So it's very robust. It's technology that's been developed over 50 years. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. It's, and it's not just about the media. It's how is the filters designed? How does the air flow through the filter? How do you ensure you don't have channeling? You don't have paths of least resistance. It's how we engineer even the inside of the filter grid as well. You know, you have to make sure you don't have smooth surfaces anywhere. So there's a lot of technology that goes into molecular filtration. HEPA filtration, again, like I said, HEPA filtration is easy in comparison. Which is, which is interesting too, because again, you're coming at it from, you know, your, your history, company's history is coming at it from dealing, dealing with the laboratory situation. So high concentrations of constituents, you know, dealing, you know, I mean, lab would work very high concentrations, you know, yeah. direct capture. So, you know, all the efficiency as far as the airflows, I mean, airflows are a big deal for you guys, because with your capture hood, you've got to make sure that you're actually in training what's in that hood and getting it through your, your processing yeah. and it's not coming back out in the breathing zone. But it, it's so there's yeah. more, I mean, I think there's more of a nuance with general indoor air quality and you know, office spaces and places like that, non-critical areas like laboratory environments, where we're dealing with, first of all, much lower levels of constituents. You know, True. Generally, <laughs> you yes. know, and, uh, you know, and, and usually bigger areas, bigger volumes, right? Because you, again, you you've got in a lab hood environment, you're kind of in a captive area. Or you're, that's the design. Whereas you know we're dealing with a general open environment in most spaces with indoor air quality issues. So how, how like how from what you guys have learned in the lab uh, control area, how, how does that how does that pl play out and cross play into just general indoor air quality issues? In yeah, it's, it's it's understanding how air moves, right? It's not always you don't always throw more air at a problem and, and determine it to be the solution. It's so we, we actually we, we learned a lot um, molecular on the molecular side and specifically the fume hood side, because, yeah, we have to we're capturing at concentration loads. But we have to adhere to strict standards, which means we have to ensure we have 100 feet per minute at the face velocity. And we have to do that in a manner in which we have the fans calibrated and where they, they're not too fast. Because if you run air too quickly past that molecular filter, it's not going to capture appropriately. You don't have proper residency time. So we learn a lot there and we, we kind of integrated that in all that knowledge into open area space and really what's needed. Uh, Air, air is passive. I mean, it's going to flow. We have, if we have a fan pulling air, the air is going to go there. It's not that hard to get air to the filter media. Um, but you don't, that said, you can't just have one unit in an open area. And that's why we have to calculate it, calculate the space to determine the quantity of units necessary. And that's what, that's what really bothers us as well. Cause you know, you see a lot of these schools, Oh, I bought a corner unit. It's sitting there in the corner behind the desk, behind student, you know, behind Larry. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> what is that air? And you, now you're compromising the integrity of the airflow that that unit's supposed to be providing. And not to mention that unit's not giving you enough air, air processing for that one room. So it's really about sizing it appropriately for the space you're, you're installing it. It gets us into, uh, not trouble, but it, you know, we'll lose opportunities because we're going to, we say, Bob, you're going to need 15 units. What do you mean I need 15 units? Well, in order for this device to work effectively, you have to understand you're going to need 15 units. And the customers just be like, yeah, I'm, no, no, thank you. And then they just go with the Amazon product. And well, yeah, because that's the problem for general consumers too, they you know, and, not, and, and you know, like off the shelf solutions, right? At a, you know, at a retail outlet, you know, box store, whatever. You yeah. know, these units say, oh, it's good for, you know, uh, 1200 square feet or whatever, I'm just throwing a number out there. <laughs> and it's like, you know, so, you know, on, on a general consumer's mind, oh, well, my house is, you know, my house is 1500 square feet. That should pretty much do my house. But it, no, no. <laughs> the airflow patterns don't work that way. You know, it's like, no. it, it, do, you, do you live in a single room? Yeah. Maybe, maybe it would work, you know. <laughs> In a bedroom, yeah. If it's for your bedroom, sure. Who cares? You you know, it's but not for commercial space. And we we don't we don't sell to the residential market because this is not a residential product. We way overkill, right? right? Um, and it's an install product. It's it's all commercial based, and yeah, it, it's <laughs> you have to size it appropriately. And yeah, we again, that's part of the education that we're doing, and it's a lot of it. Well, how so? How you know to get back to you know you were talking about 
uh, achieving ventilation equivalencies. How 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 is that calculated? You know, just if you share just a quick so you know, quick each mindset unit, on that. Each unit draws 170 CFM, right? So it's 10,200 cubic feet an hour. So for every you calculate that for every 3,500 cubic feet of space, that's going to be provide you with a, an air change equivalency of about three and a half air change rates per hour, give or take, plus or minus, and that's really how we calculate it. Um, there's, there's nothing to hide there. That's and if we if we push more air through it, it's it's not going to do no good because then we just create a turbulent environment. Not to mention the system's going to be way too noisy and people are just going to turn it down anyway. And that's the other thing. You know, you get a lot of these systems. Oh, it processes 1,200 cfm at high setting, which is at 75 decibels. <laughs> I'm not, that's not going to run. That's no way. Right. So I'm going to turn that down to a low setting. No, ours, that setting that we provide you with, that's running at about 54 decibels, 2,800 RPM. It's the sweet spot. You know, any higher than that, you don't have proper diffusion of smaller particles. You have to worry about that too. You know, so it's, you can't just add more air to the problem and consider it to be the solution. Well, we get into that conversation, not not just with air filtration, like even just HEPA equipment in the IAQ industry, yeah. you know, and you, you got these, you know, uh, air duct machines where they, they put a, uh, you know, 24 by 24 by 12 inch pleated filter in Big, there. huge filter, yes. and, you know and, and they and, but but they're claiming they got 4000 cfm capacity it's like you don't have a 24 by 24 by 12 hepa that can handle 4000 cfm no I, you don't no. you know I, I i always laugh when i go to trade shows and see that and i go that's not going to work you're either choking the fan or you're going to yeah. overdrive the filter there's no way that works in the real that's world right. you know, just do the math yeah I, <laughs> absolutely but the general consumer doesn't know that, Bob, and that's that's the challenge. They just don't. They're not educated on it. They know what they know, and this isn't. They never had to deal with indoor air quality issues before. Well, I would argue the commercial consumers, for the most part, don't understand it either. Is, that's you know, what I mean. Say, yeah. You know, oh, you know, yeah. obviously, certainly the homeowners don't have a clue on most of this stuff. But you know, as a consultant, you know, for thirty-five years, I, I walk into commercial facilities all the time, and people are kind of clueless on most of this. Absolutely. I think I just saw, I think, I think it was Patrick just asked a question, but it's not showing up on my screen anymore. If any oh. plans on making a design for, I, I, I lost it. Oh yeah, I've got it here. So any, any plans on making a design uh, or would these units be adaptable to replace a HEPA machine in a remediation project? So I, I think the question is, could these be used as uh, standalone devices for short-term usage in spaces? Sure. Um, Patrick, yes, the design, it, we're in the process right now. So there will, we, have, we, we will have a solution that is adaptable to be plug and play, essentially, and it will be portable. Um, but it, will still be, it won't be positioned at the floor level. We'll still have it basically on an L bracket almost because, again, airflow patterns. We just don't want to put it on the corner and, and, and drive polluted air down past the breathing zone. But, yes, it will be more portable than it is today in the next version. We'll, have, we'll still have two versions because this is absolutely perfect on the commercial setting. Um, but, yes, uh, probably towards the end of the year, we're looking at a December launch. Interesting. Um, yeah, because I mean, obviously, the, your existing product is designed to really be a permanent install. It's it's a, right. a retrofit replacement mm -hmm. uh, in in the space, and and it, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, to have have something that you get out of the way, but still serviceable. Because that's the other other thing. You, you can put things way out of the way, and then will will the service work that needs to be done on the device be done? And I'm, I'm assuming these they look like they're fairly easily accessible. Oh, extremely. I mean, there's there's push pins. The unit drops down. You you take the HEPA filter out. You replace it. There's a pre-filter above on the grids that just slides in and out, much like your heating filter. Um, the HEPA filters. I mean, three to five years on average would be the replacement you know requirement. So I mean, you get a lot a lot a lot of time used on these HEPA filters. It's not a, you don't have to replace them annually. It would be overkill to do that unless you have an area of high humidity and then you have moisture issues and you could potentially, you know, then there could be mold spores growing. We don't want that either. So it's obviously depends on the environment in which the halo is installed, but on average three to five years would be the regular maintenance. I mean, that's true with any equipment too. I, you know, without naming a brand, you know, I've had a, uh, a standalone HEPA filtered unit um, uh, in my bedroom running for like 15 years. Um, and I'm real happy with it. You know, and it's definitely a consumer type unit. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
but as far as changing out HEPA filters, I'm I'm not going to lie. I've changed the HEPA filter once in 15 years. I've changed the pre filters a lot. Sure. And yeah, I have the I have the luxury of having a laser particle counter where I can go over and look at what's coming out of the output <laughs> right. of this. Thing. And I'm like, right. you know, and and I will honestly say, my wife, you know, Christy will go like, why aren't we changing? You, you know, you high IQ man, why aren't you changing the HEPA filter? I go, you don't freaking need to change. I'm looking at it. It's 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 doing 99 percent capture here. Why, why would Absolutely. I change it? The airflow's there. You know. It yeah. is loud, though. I, I will say, you know, if for a consumer in a bedroom, those end up being a white noise generator. I can't even sleep in hotels anymore without having the sound of that fan. It's programmed in my head, and it, it's quite loud. <laughs> so uh, any other – let's get some more questions from the audience. I know we still have a bunch of people out there. Um, we still have 10 minutes left uh, till close, so we could entertain one or two more questions. Um, you know, have, so here's – I'm question for Jesse here. Um 2020, obviously, you couldn't have foresaw that in 2019. No. <laughs> what, what was what was going to you know uh, happen business wise and having to do a shift, and it was I mean was that kind of challenging? I mean because it seems like a lot of companies faced severe you know it was a severe challenge. I mean yeah, how did you guys how did you guys uh, roll with that? And you know do you think that's going to make you a stronger company in the long run? You learn a lot about who you have as employees when something like that happens, right? Um, cause everybody got shifted to remote immediately and you, you know what you have, you know, if, if people are working from home and, and they're just kind of going day by day and doing the least that they possibly can to get by, you will know quickly. Um, we're lucky enough that we had a team that, you know, they took the challenge and they, and they really ran with it. And, you know, it actually ended up being a very decent year for us because everybody just worked as hard as they could. I wouldn't say we, we, we saw a growth. We, we, we didn't, I mean, but we also didn't see it. We didn't regress either. Now that, that speaks a lot for who we have on the, on the team. Um, so we, yeah, we learn a lot. We learn about a lot about, I guess, our moral compass internally. Sure. And, and, and how people are going to adapt to challenges. Um, you know, we, we, I guess, benefited a little bit. I hate to use that word from COVID because labs, they, they were still working. They're trying to develop a vaccine. You have PCR tests, you know, you, all different kinds of things going on in the laboratory where they still needed hoods. They needed storage solutions. They needed the halos for VOC mitigation and things like that. We really didn't start uh, ramping up to sell the halo HEPA until August to September of, of, of 2020. So it really wasn't a big part of our business in, in 2020. That really wasn't what, what uh, propelled our business. It was still servicing the laboratories. And that's another thing I, I just want to point out real quick. When you're looking at solutions, find out what that company was doing before COVID. <laughs> Please, you know, because if that company before COVID never existed or was not in filtration <laughs> or whatever, just do your research because th there are charlatans out there. Just caution yourself, educate yourself, educate yourself on the company itself. Well, that's a given in any crisis. I mean, you know, you have, you have a you have a major hurricane up the east coast, and suddenly everybody and their brother does mold remediation. You know, I mean, that's just yeah, sure. Uh, you know, yeah. it's it's, it's 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 unfortunately the nature of a free economy or a somewhat free economy. Yeah, I yeah, I guess you can't blame them. They're all trying to make a buck, but. It's but that raises an issue, though, because, again, you're in a more issue. regulated environment when you're dealing with the laboratory environment, right? There's <laughs> a lot of sta yeah. lots of standards, right? Yeah. But but when you're talking about pr providing devices for general consumers, not so much, right? No. The, I mean, the FTC no. gets involved, you know, if there's totally false or misleading advertising. Yeah. But they don't have very big teeth in this arena. I mean, they, they no. reportedly do, but they really don't. I mean, companies – over the no. years, and I won't, I won't name the brand and I won't name the technology, but there was a company that was doing technology that was, you know, EPA railed on it several decades ago. You know, the company got fined by the FTC and then they're back in six months under a different brand. And a different name. <laughs> selling the same thing with different logos on it. I mean, it's yeah. like they had, it's it's frustrating. You know, it's it's the Wild West out there right now, what we're dealing with. You know, I think Tim's on the call. You know, he, he's my partner in crime here on in this division. And, yeah, it's the Wild West and it's – <laughs> just shake our heads every day go oh, my word <laughs> what is going on out there there has to be right i i hope there's regulations written at some point in time legislation steps in somewhere and writes yeah. some sort of you know i don't know guidelines of caveat emptor you know i mean i mean it, it just is i mean I, I, unfortunately yeah 
Yeah. yeah that's it, what all I can do is sigh sometimes. I know. Well, me too, as a consultant. I know probably many of you on the call have the same thing. You got yeah. all experience these sort of things uh, probably on a daily basis as well. Um, so, you know, obviously you're focused, you've been, companies have been focused on commercial laboratories and then, you know, on commercial spaces. Are there any plans for you to get into uh, a residential version of some, some of your technology? Is that, that no, may be on the future? We've talked about it. It's just, you know, I don't know if that's right for us as a, as a company. We don't know yet. We're, 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 it's in the talks. You know, we have our, our meetings and is this, does this make sense for us? Do we have the bandwidth to handle the residential market? Do we want to? Um, you know, we really want to be seen as true specialists in the commercial side. There's a lot of there's, there's a lot of brand equity we've built in this in this market, and I don't know if the same would exist in the residential side. We'd have to kind of devalue the brand a little bit too, because we'd have to adjust. We'd have to design a product that wasn't didn't really meet our standards in the residential, because you'd have sure. it's price. Yeah, no, I mean, it totally. It's a different. It's a totally different market, and it, totally, it, it, just totally distribution. Market. You'd have to have you yeah. know retail distribution too. That's a whole different thing. It's completely different. So we just don't know yet. You know. Right, right now, I would say no, but you never know. You never know what changes. Yeah, uh, that's true. That's true. You never know what's around next year's corner. Yeah, um, so, sure. so we're at the point where we're we're going to wrap this up. So, Jesse, any, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give us some final thoughts because you know, obviously, we ran pretty fast here today, and I'm sure there's at least one burning comment that you really wanted to get in there, um, or or just a final closing over overall thought on uh, our discussion today. So, I'll, I'm going to give you the floor. Oh, I thank you. You know, I, I think I've said it is, is, you know, anybody that's looking for a solution, please educate yourself on the technology. Do your due diligence, understand the testing that was performed, really dive deep into the results to make sure that it's not, you know, done in a controlled chamber. That's a two by two chamber because anything's going to pass. See if there's real world testing, peer to review data, um, educate yourself on the company itself, what they did beforehand, um, how relevant they are the brand equity, the credibility they have behind them. All of that's very important because um, this is a problem that isn't going away. Like I think we said, unfortunately, obviously indoor air quality issues aren't going away. And I just don't see SARS-CoV-2 going away like we all had hoped. So so please do your due diligence. I guess that's that's my leaving my my leaving statement that I would like to, you know, leave here with. <laughs> hey, th th those are good words. Um... And yeah, it's not going away soon. I mean, I know we're all we're all experiencing fatigue on, yes. on this pandemic, clearly, right? I mean, you know, all of us are. But just as what's being evidenced right now in India, I mean, it's just an awful situation there. And we're, you know, yes, be, I, I think we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And certainly in the United States, things look better than they did a while ago. But, you know, this is still a global problem. So long as there's, you know, uh, you know this deadly virus floating around the planet, you know, in, in, in modifying itself, there's certainly more problems on the horizon. And, and, and we all have to address this as a global community. So that's, that's a big deal. Um, one of the things, so I want to take this opportunity just to uh, throw a quick plug in for Healthy Indoors. Um, obviously, many of you are watching this through our portal at healthyindoors.com, which is uh, where uh, all the issues of our uh, digital publications, our magazines reside, as well as the back back episodes and recordings from the healthy indoors show and the audio uh podcast from our show too we have all that up there and available um one of the things that you still have an opportunity for today is the 29th for two more days you still have an opportunity to get a uh, a, a free uh pro membership to our new uh online global community platform which is something that we're going to be releasing um very soon to the general public uh, again, this is a, a dedicated platform that will allow you to network and communicate with other people on the topics of indoor air quality. So think of it uh, as a bit more than social media, a lot more than social media, but an area where people of like uh, like interest can uh, contribute and uh, speak amongst yourselves, as well as uh, places where we will have a repository of lots of information, live streamed events, yada, yada. It's going to be some great stuff there. We're super excited about this can't stress it enough so that's um something to be looking for and again if you want to take an uh take advantage of that opportunity to get the uh premium you know le level membership you still have a couple days that you can sign up and pre-register for that so uh, i guess without further ado uh, i really want to uh, thank jesse for joining us today this is a great discussion um you know again we never have enough time i guess i mean these topics we 
I, we, you and I could probably go on for three hours and not even oh. uh, scratch, <laughs> scratch the surface. Absolutely. Um, but, um, I, you know, I do appreciate uh, your time with us on the show today. And thanks, thanks for sharing your insight and what you're coming from. Um, I thank you again to all of you in the uh, virtual studio audience. Thanks for taking time out of your work day to be here for an hour with us. Um, definitely appreciate it. We appreciate your support and uh, your interest. Uh, so until next week, uh, we'll, we'll be here again, same time, same channel, uh, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time for the Healthy Indoors live show. 